<laughs> holy, holy, hallelujah. Yeah, glorious, man, glorious, glorious. Oh, I love that. That is so true in every way. God has blessed us and, and God gives us grace and God gives us mercy and, and way more than any of us deserve in life and thank the Lord that he does and that he loves us in spite of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I know. It's in spite of ourselves. Yesterday, uh, Tanya and I went up to a family reunion, her, her family, in uh, a little state park in, in Clark County, Mississippi, up near Meridian and equipment and all that area up there. We were at a state park. <clears throat> we were all out there and I found out that um, some of them they live in all up parts of the state. Some of them have been watching our service. And, um, and I found out that when I get too long, they, they go back to the music. And, and I just want y'all to know that when you do that, we see it. So don't be, you no, know, I know you thought I, you, know, you can do it and nobody would know. We can see it and we've been praying. I would say, Lord, everybody that sticks with me to the end, bless them. And everybody that clicks off, I'm taking it off. I'm taking my request away. No, you know I'm kidding, really, about that. Uh, we can't see you, really. We can't see when you do anything different. If you click off, we'll, we'll have 400 people watching or 300 or 250 or something like that. And I don't know whether that means they just clicked on there for about two minutes and then clicked off or what, or they watched the whole thing. We don't know, have any idea. But there are a lot of people that watch and, um, and I, I'm thankful that the Lord uses this as a tool and, and other ministries. I mean, it's not just our church, obviously, but all kinds of other ministries. And it's a great tool uh, for the Lord. And one of the, one of the victories that may come out of all this craziness is that um, the opportunity for people to, to, to learn about how to get into these things and find things that'll bless them, uh, you know, that might be a great opportunity for people. And so even though we want everybody in the sanctuary, uh, we know that everybody's risk factor is probably not that high. I know some of you have, you know, you don't even care about risk. R risk is not even on your radar. You don't even think about it. And, uh, but some people are, you know, they're really, um, uh, they're really cautious of things. And so anyway, we're glad we have this tool and the Lord. We started last week and I didn't know that it might become a short series on uh, how to be ready for the rapture. I should have known because, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of scripture in this. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, the, the, we're going to read the whole chapter of Matthew 25 by the time it's over. And I'm hoping I can get, I told you last week that I would give you six words that would prepare you for the return of Christ. And I shared with you the first two words last week, and it was, know Jesus. Uh, and it's from the first parable in the 25th. Well, you guys do know <clears throat> that when Jesus spoke these words and when these words were written into the scripture, that they, they weren't written in a chapter, right? You'd, you're aware of this. That G it, Jesus, uh, when he said these things, they, they were just recorded uh, and, and it was just one long narrative. It wasn't like chapter 24 and then chapter 25. And, you know, that these chapters and verses were put in by translators later on down the line so that it would make it easy for us to refer to things and look at things and at, be at the same place and we'd know where we were and that kind of thing. It was just for, for the effort to do that, that chapters and verses were put in. So really Matthew 24 and 25, it was all just one big narrative. It wasn't a split in there at all. But for the sake of the way it's recorded in, in our word and, and the way we look at it, chapter 24 of Matthew talks about some signs of the return of Christ. And I don't want to really get deep into this. If you're interested in deep in, into any of this, come on Wednesday and ask a question. That's all you have to do, and we'll go, and you can learn everything you thought about and maybe some things you didn't think about about this thing. But in Matthew 24, the disciples asked three questions. What, when will these things be? The temple, they were talking about the temple. When was it going to be destroyed? And it happened in 70 AD, Titus, Roman general. Then there were two other questions. What will be the sign of your return? And, and the second question, the end of the age. So Jesus sets out to answer that in 24 and 25. And in 24, he starts talking to them. And remember, they are Jewish men. The disciples are Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. The tribulation is, 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 is all about the Jews. 
and all about the judgments in the earth. And they, God has a covenant with them and, and they're going to be protected and all kinds of things like that. So he starts telling them when they are in the tribulation period, what are some of the things that they need to know is going to happen in the tribulation period? And so uh, he tells them that. And then right at the end of chapter 24, he starts talking to, to we Christians. And he says, now, that's what's going to happen for them. You need to know what's going to happen to you. What's going to happen to you is, I'm going to come back for you. Uh, the word is paralambano, which means I'm going to take you. It means to receive to myself. And he said, now, for you Christians, you need to know this, that, that all of that stuff I just said to the Jewish people, that, that's for them. That's what's going to happen, and they need to know that. But for you, here's what you need to know. You need to know that I'm coming, and there are going to be two people working in the field, and one of them's going to be taken, and the other one's going to be left. And women are going to be grinding at the mill. Uh, I don't know if they still grind at the mill today, but whatever they would be, whatever they would be doing, shopping at the grocery store, or you know, uh, you know, whatever it might be. I don't know what it might be, but but whatever that is, the two of them will be doing it, and one of them will be taking, and one of them will be left. And he's describing um, quite intricately the fact that when he comes for us, that he is, it is going to be when no one expects it. It's going to be business as usual. Everything's going to be going on just like nothing's going to happen. And we're going to be marrying and giving in marriage. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be doing business and buying and selling things. And, and then all of a sudden, boom, Jesus comes in the clouds. He doesn't come to the earth. He comes in the clouds and he calls us up into the clouds with him. And all of us who are Christians and know the Lord are going to be taken. And those that don't know the Lord are going to be left. And then in Matthew 25, he transitions to tell us, to warn us that we must be ready for this. Because if we are not ready for this, we're going to be left behind. And we need to know if we're ready. This is not something that should be hanging in your life. And that you should know, and he gives us two parables and a true story in Matthew 25 to tell us and warn us what to look for and how to be prepared when he comes. The first one, and I said six words, know Jesus. The first parable was the parable of the ten virgins. And the ten virgins, all of them were virgins, all of them were waiting on the bridegroom to come. They, were all, they all thought they were ready and they were prepared. So this obviously is talking about the church and talking about people that are waiting on the return of the Lord, the, the, our bridegroom, we're the bride of Christ. And, but five of them were wise and five were foolish. Five were wise because they had plenty of oil in their lamps. Because if he came at night, you were gonna need to light your lamp and be able to see and go with him and follow him and so forth. But five of them were foolish and they had no oil for their lamp or not an, uh, enough oil. And they said to the ones that had, you know, they said to the ones that had oil, hey, give us some of your oil. And they said, no, we can't because if we do, we might not have enough ourselves. You go to the store and buy some. Well, wouldn't you know it? The Lord comes and the five that had the oil went with him and they went into the bride, bride uh, went into the, uh, the marriage chamber and shut the door. And the five foolish ones, when they bought their oil, they come running back to the door and they start beating on the door. They start saying, Lord, Lord, you know, as if they know him, as if he is their Lord. And you know what he said? He said, I don't know you. So the first thing in being ready for the return of Jesus is to know the Lord. Yeah, yeah. It is a personal thing. You don't get grandfathered in. You don't, you don't come in because, because you, you had a fine family and they love the Lord. Or that, that you, know, you married somebody that was a great Christian and they go to church and you somehow get to kind of slide in under the radar. No, no, no. Won't, won't, be, won't be any of that. Jesus said, I either know you or I don't know you. Not, I did know you and you got away. 
Not, I did know you, but you sinned too much and I had to throw you back in. He said, I never knew you. I don't know you. <laughs> you are not mine. And so I said, wouldn't it be nice to know if you really know the Lord? And so I gave you seven indications that tell you whether you know the Lord or not. And we started with the first one, and I'm, I'm not going to re-preach these. I'm just going to go over them. Uh, you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of your life. Have you done that? Have you confessed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead and that he's Lord of your life? Simple. You've either, you, you've either done that or you haven't done it. Number two, you believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. He's not one of the ways. He is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So unless Jesus was wrong, and I don't think he was, uh, you can't come by some other religion, some other belief system, following some other guru or, or, or book of holy stuff or whatever it might be. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Now, I didn't make that rule. I didn't write that in the Bible. That's what God said. Number three, your life has changed since you've accepted Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that you are perfect. Everybody say, I'm not perfect. All right, I'm not perfect. And you're not going to be perfect until you get to heaven. Jesus was the only perfect person that ever lived. And you're not going to be, but you should strive to be. That should be your aim, your goal. In other words, have, has anything moved toward God in your life since you made some kind of profession or did something that you think got you ready for Jesus' return? Has it moved in any positive direction toward God? If not, you need, you, you, that's, that's, a, that's a red flag, all right? Number four, you hear God's voice. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to audibly hear it. A lot of people say they do. There are people that I know, pastors, and you hear them preach, and they'll say, I was doing it, and God said to me, and, and you know, I mean, all kinds of things like that, and it's not as if God can't speak in an audible voice. I just never have heard an audible voice. I've heard all kinds, I mean, I've sensed it in my spirit. I've heard it in my heart. I've uh, been directed by circumstances. I've heard messages and, 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 and the Holy Spirit just activate me and go, that's it. You know, I mean, I've heard him in all kinds of ways. But here's what I want to tell you. God knows your language. Yeah. And whatever way you need to hear him, he's going to give it to you that way. Yeah. Have you, do you hear him? Uh, is there any indication that you are interacting with God at all since you did whatever you did that you think makes you ready, all right? Number five, you believe that you are saved by grace and not by works or being a good person. And the reason I say this is because if you can believe that you can be saved by works or by being a good person, what you are saying is you don't need Jesus. Jesus came and died in vain because you are so good that you're going to go to heaven because you're so good. Jesus didn't have to die for you. You don't need Jesus. He needs you. See, you, that's the attitude. And, and, and so you don't get to heaven by being good, all right, because you can't be good enough and you can't do enough good stuff either. I know people, they try to do all kinds of philanthropic things and do all kinds of uh, positive things, and they think that makes them go to heaven. I, I, we quoted the Barna Research Survey last week on lots of things. And so anyway, uh, number, five, number six, you receive God's word. This means that, that when God speaks to you, you hear his voice, you hear him. You, you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and, I, and, and my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. And then he says, and they won't follow another shepherd because when he speaks, they don't know his voice. Right. Right. But when I speak, my sheep hear me and follow me. And then he had this big deal with the, with the, with the Pharisees one day, and they were talking you know, trash about him, and, 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 and they were angry, and they were insulted by him. And he said, you know why you're trying to kill me? You are trying to kill me because my word has no place in you. Hey, guys, it's not a mystery to me why you want to kill me and you won't accept me, and it's, it's because my, 
My word is not in you. you it, it has no place in you. So you receive God's word. When God speaks, do you hear God? When the shepherd leads, do you, do you, do you sense that? Do you, do you follow that? Do you know? I mean, these are indications that you actually do know God and you are ready for his coming. None of these things can you do and they get you ready for it. No, no, they are just reflections of whether you are ready or not. And then the last one was, you love God's family, the church. Yeah, Jesus, as a matter of fact, here's what Jesus said. He said, the way the world will know that you are my disciples is if you love one another. Not, hey, not if you, not, not, not if you gather, not if you uh, build together, not if you uh, get on the same team. Not if, he said, the way that the world will know that you belong to me is that you guys, in spite of anything, will show that you love one another. And don't forsake the assembling of yourself, but assemble more as you see the day approaching. I mean, he, he instructs us of these things. He, he said, how can you say you love me who you don't see and hate your brother who you do see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we love God's family. We, we love the church. We're loving, we're loving people. All right, so that is know Jesus. Those are the first two words. Here are the second two words. Serve Jesus. The parable of the talents is the second parable in Matthew 25. The parable of the talents is about gifts, abilities, and as the word indicates, talents. Now the word talent in the Bible doesn't mean like a skill that you have, like you're talented to play music or you're talented to sing, or like me, you're talented to dance, uh, that kind of stuff. It means talent in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Talent in the Bible <laughs> means a measurement of weight. Okay. So when you see a, the word talent used in the Bible, it's talking about uh, a way to measure weight. And, and it's talking about something being valuable because of how much it weighs. And to give you an example, a talent of gold. If someone gave you a talent of gold, they would be giving you two years wages. That's a lot of money, right? How much money does it take for you to live a year? Well, I could scratch by on 25,000 maybe. You know, just eat by. Uh, I could live a pretty decent on 50,000 a year. But I could live lavishly like on 100,000 a year. I think I could take 100,000 and live pretty, pretty high on the hog. Well, if you did that, that uh, the reason I'm saying this is because you're going to see that this Lord of these servants give them a lot of money is what I'm trying to show you. That when he gives one five talents, <laughs> he might be giving them a million dollars, guys. I mean, it's a lot of money that he invests in these guys and then leaves and goes away and expects some return when he gets back. Well, the parable of the talents obviously is about the gifts and the abilities and the talents and so forth that the Lord gives us because he gives all of us gifts, he gives all of us abilities, he gives all of us um, opportunities. I mean, these are, the, these are gifts from God to us. And what the parable of the talents says is you need to be aware of the fact that when he returns, He's going to hold you accountable for what you did with what he gave you. Yeah. All of that stuff, let me, let me just read it. Let me begin reading it. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. That's 10 years worth of salary. To another, he gave two talents, four years worth of salary. And to one, to another, he gave one talent, two years worth of, worth of money. Look at, look at what it said. To each according to his own ability. I want you to notice that line. He did not just helter-skelter throw out gifts. He gave us gifts according to our own ability. 
In other words, your ability to do what? Your ability to steward the gifts that he gives you. To use them properly. To invest them properly. To use them wisely. To take care of them. To, to, to benefit with them. To steward. The word steward. Where we get the word stewardship. So he gives each one of us gifts according to what he knows about our ability to use these gifts wisely. All right. And immediately he went on a journey. You know this is Jesus, right? He went away. He's away now, and he's going to come back, right? All right, he's gone now, but he's going to come back. He went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. There's a payday someday, guys. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five, talent, five more talents besides them. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things, and I'm going to make you ruler over many. Enter into the joys of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. That, that's what he thought about his Lord. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I, I mean, he said, if you thought that I reap where I haven't sown, if you thought that's the way I was and that I gathered where I don't scatter seed, then you should have taken my money and put it in the bank and I would have at least had interest at my coming. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, who has what? who has the ability to steward the gifts of God. To everyone that has the ability to use the gifts wisely, God said, I'm going to give you more. And to those who have not, have what not. Don't have the ability to steward what God has given them. They don't try to steward what God has given them. They just take it and hide it. I'm going to take away even that which doesn't even belong to them. It's, it's, the, it's the Lord's gifts, it's not yours. So he's going to take back, oh my Lord, oh, and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable concerns the purpose of our life. So, what is the purpose of our life? The purpose of our life, according to this parable, is that we serve Jesus. Like the Lord who gave all of these servants these gifts, God gives us gifts in order to serve him. Why does God gift us? Why does God invest in us? Why does God talent us? It is because he wants us to use those gifts, use those talents, use those abilities. Take advantage of the, of the access you have. God has blessed you mightily. He's given you a wonderful brain. He's, you, you, you've disciplined yourself. You've got a degree. You make money. You make a lot of money. You do a lot of things. You have a lot of advantages. And some have maybe lesser, but they have, they have way more than any of us deserve. And some have very few, but, but, but it doesn't matter how many you have. It matters what you do with what you have because Jesus wants you to know 
Why did he put this in the 25th chapter? Why did he say, let me warn you about something? Because he wants us to know that, that, we, that he is going to hold us accountable for how we use these gifts that he gives us. Now, to show you that this is not inconsistent with the word, the rest of the word of God, in 1 Corinthians 3, the apostle Paul tells us about the judgment seat of Christ. After the rapture, and we're in heaven with him, only Christians, we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's the, called the Bema, B-E-M-A. It means the reward seat. Not, not judging whether you're lost or saved. If you're not saved, you won't be there. But judging how you did with what he gave you to do with. And let me, let me just read you what Paul, how Paul described it. Here's how Paul described it, beginning in 1 Corinthians 3, 7. All right. You need to know this. Paul and Apollos, the people are trying to make an argument between them. Paul's a preacher. Apollos is a preacher. Apollos is wonderful, gifted, smooth, beautiful voice, wonderful man. Paul's squeaky, looks like a little duck with his bill on him, bald-headed, got a voice. He's aggravating. All right, so the people are trying to start this little deal between him and Apollos, and here's what Paul said. So then, neither, he said, so, he said Apollos, I plant and Apollos waters. Or Apollos plants and I water. So that's what the discussion is to start with. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. No, we're, we're working for the same cause here, guys. We're on the same team. And each one, look at this though, will receive his own reward according to his own Labor. You, you, you're not going to get in on somebody else's good works here now. You're not going to slide in because you sat next to them in church. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's, and, and I put this word because it, in the Greek it really indicates this, cultivated field. You're not just God's field. God's cultivated you. He's put some investment in you. You are God's building according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Now he's gonna tell you that you've got a foundation that's Jesus Christ and you can build on that foundation. Look at what he says. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who have the foundation of Jesus Christ, whose building of your life is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That's the only foundation that we're concerned about. If you don't have the foundation, it doesn't matter what you build. Because it's going to be burnt up. So you got the foundation of Jesus. Now look at what he says. All right, now if anyone builds on this foundation, you got two kind of lives you can build on the foundation. If anybody builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, that's one way you can build on this foundation. And the other way is wood, hay, and straw. So you got a choice of what kind of life you build on the foundation of Jesus. Each one's work will become clear for the day what? The day of the Bema judgment. We'll declare it because it will be revealed by fire, the refining fire of Jesus Christ. And the fire will test each one's work, look at this, of what sort it is. It doesn't say how long it is or how much it is or how big it is. It just says what kind of work is it? That's what he's judging. It, it, it's not like you did more than me and I did more than you and they did more than us and they did it longer and they were in forever and they just got in. It's not how long, how big, how much. Or, it's what, did, what kind of work did you do? Yeah. What did you do with what God gave you to do with? He's not going to judge you based on what he gave me or me what he gave Justin or Holly or Bev or Lawrence or any, you know, Brian, any of you guys. He's going to judge my work with his gifts on what I did with what he gave me. Now, look at what happened. 
If anyone's work which he has built on in, in, built on it endures, so gold, silver, and precious stone is going to endure, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, wood, hay, and stubble, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. What he's saying here is, if you build a life of gold, silver, and precious stones on your foundation of Jesus, when the, when the, when the, when the refining fire of Jesus judges the work of your life, it's going to stand there firm and, 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 end, and result in reward for you because it didn't get burned up in the fire. You say, what kind of work would that be? Well, it would be selfless work. It would be humble work. It would be sacrificial work. It would be no pride for me, no, no gain, no venture for me. It means what I do in sacrificing myself for the kingdom of God. That's gold, silver, and precious stone. It's, more, it, it, it's better than a Norman Rockwell painting. I'm, I'm gonna give you one example and I'm not bragging on myself. I just know this about my life and I don't know everything about yours. <laughs> But I, when I was preaching, and I was, Tanya and I, it was our first uh, church to pastor, and, and it had 19 people in it, and it was in Clark County, Mississippi, a little bitty place, and I was probably, what, 20 years old, 21, 22, something like that, years old, and Justin was two, and Amy was one, just born down there, and there was this little girl that came to church. Her parents didn't come to church. She and her little sister came to church. She was about 10 years old, blonde hair, uh, her, her little sister was about eight years old and they came to church. I don't know if they walked wrote, or, or somebody brought them with them or whatever, but, but they, they were there. And, that, and, and, and this little blonde-headed girl sat right down on the front row every Sunday. And one Sunday after church, she came and she brought, a, she had, on a piece of notebook paper, she had drawn uh, an image. And it looked, I mean, really, it looked like King Kong standing on a building you know, with fire, you know, coming out of his mouth or something. And, and, I, and she gave it to, she said, here, Pastor, and on it, and she said, here, Pastor Keith, this is for you. And I said, oh, oh baby, this is, this is nice. Uh, what, is, what is it, you know? And she said, that's you, Pastor Keith, that's you. And I looked at that thing, and it looked like King Kong with, you know, and, and he was up doing this, you know, like that. And then, but right down here, it said, thank you for telling me about Jesus. That is gold, silver, and precious stone. That's more precious than a Norman Rockwell painting because that's not going to be burned up at the judgment seat. That's going through the fire. So you can build wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone, and you're going to be saved. You're not going to go to hell if you suffer loss, but you're going to come so close, you're going to smell like smoke is basically what it, what it and you're going to be just flowing right down, and he's just going to grab you up and go, whoa, no, we can't let you go there. You got the foundation. You just don't have any rewards to give. So this is talking about my motive, why I do things, my methods, how I do things, and my management, uh, how I manage all the gifts that I've been given by God. I quoted to you last week from the Barna survey, recent, uh, August 2020. It's brand new. And, and let me just kind of run back a second on something and then, because I got to have a point I want to make out of it. I'm going to just read from it. Slightly less than one half, 48%, of Christian respondents believe that a person who is generally good or does enough good things for others will earn a place in heaven. 58% of Americans believe that no absolute moral truth exists and that the basis of truth are sources and factors other than God. 77% said that right and wrong are determined by factors and standards other than the Bible. 59% said that the Bible is not God's authoritative and true word. And then 69% said that people are basically good. From that description in this survey, I'm going to draw a conclusion about Americans. Americans believe that the purpose of life is to feel good about yourself. 
that my purpose in life is that I live a life and I develop a, a way of thinking and imagining the, the realities of spiritual life so that I can feel good about myself. Now, is that the purpose of life? No, that is not the purpose of life. What is the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to glorify God and to expand his kingdom. Now, don't get me wrong. I want you to feel good about yourself. God wants you to feel good about yourself. But that's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is that we glorify him and that we advance his kingdom. We invest in his kingdom. We help build his kingdom. We expand his kingdom. That's the purpose of life. And I can show you this. In the, in the model prayer is what it actually is, but we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer, it's our prayer. I mean, it, he just told us how to pray. <laughs> it's not, he, this is how we are supposed to pray. You remember the disciples came to him. The disciples said, Lord, when we pray every day, how should we pray every day? And you remember how he started off. He said, uh, our Father, this is how you pray every day. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And it goes on, kingdom come, will be done. Last line. For thine is the kingdom. Not, not, not a kingdom. The kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. In other words, God, I don't have a kingdom. I'm not trying to build a kingdom. I'm not trying to get my own kingdom started over here. You have the only kingdom available and what and I'm going to serve your kingdom for for yours is the kingdom the power God I don't have any power I don't have any strength on my own the only strength I have is the strength you give me so God I'm going to serve your kingdom with your power and then he said and the glory which means I don't have any glory on my own either and I don't need to be trying to get glory on my own and glorify myself and get puffed up. He said, when you pray every day, you say, God, I'm going to serve your kingdom and I'm going to serve it with your power and I'm going to serve it with your glory and we're going to do this forever. That's the purpose of life. The purpose of life is not to glorify myself but to take the gifts that God has given me and use them to bring the highest profit to God on this earth. Because when he returns, I will be accountable for what I have done with my life. This is a warning. He's telling you, look, it's not just about I'm going to take you. It's what happens after that is important too. And you, I just want you to know you're going to be held accountable for some stuff. So what is the purpose for your life? To accumulate money? to be popular with everybody, to, to live a comfortable life? Well, I pray for all good things for you. I, I, I want all good things to happen to you, but Jesus told this parable so that we would know that at the end of life, we would be held accountable. Whatever we do for our livelihood, however we make our living, you're a carpenter, you're a, you're, you're, you're a, you're a nurse, you're a, an accountant, you're, you work in retail, uh, you, you do uh, construction work. Whatever your livelihood might be, you are not just that. I drive a bus for Harrison County with little school kids on it. I'm not just a bus driver. I'm a Christian bus driver which means before I represent a bus driver, I'm representing Christ. I'm looking for the kingdom of God. You're an accountant. Before, you, before you're an accountant, you are a Christian accountant. In other words, you, you represent Christ before you represent your job. You work in retail. You're not just a salesman. You are a Christian salesman. And we work for the kingdom of God before we work for anything else because you represent... You don't just represent yourself, you represent Jesus and your influence is far more powerful than you think it is. I'd give you just one little example of this. Last Thursday, one of my little kids on the bus, uh, fifth grade, 
girl. She, she, sit, she comes up and sits behind me. She starts talking to me. She said, they call me Mr. Keith. They said, Mr. Keith, um, uh, when we die, do we, do we come back as something else? Like, could we be like a, a horse or a fly or a frog or something, something like that? I said, I said, no, baby, who, who told you that? My mama. Well, you know, I don't want to get in an argument with her mama. And I don't really want to teach her something because I don't know what her mama feels about it. I mean, her mama's responsible for her. But I said, baby, don't, don't worry about that. I said, the Bible tells us what happens to us when we die. And we can go to heaven with Jesus and live there forever. And I mean, just that little inter, interaction right there. It, I don't know how much influence that might have on her. But it might come a day a year from now, two years from now, whatever it might be, she's sitting somewhere and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to her and starts saying something about, you need to give your life to me. And she's sitting there and all of a sudden she hears her old bus driver say, uh, there's a Bible and that Bible tells us that we can go to heaven when we die if we receive Christ. And then she say, I need to receive Christ. I'm not confused about this anymore. That didn't make sense anyway. God, I, I want you. So you have more influence than you think you do. People care what you say, even when they don't act like it. Especially if you represent Christ in your life. <laughs> I mean, that really helps a lot, all right? Don't let them be surprised when you say something about the Lord. Uh, you don't have to go around preaching all the time, but just don't let them be surprised when somebody says, you're a Christian? You know, it's like, you're, are you Christian? What? Yeah. I'm surprised because you hadn't acted like one. All right, uh, let me get this last one because I need to get it. All right, last two words. See, I need to quit because half the people just turned off. They just went back to the music right there. <laughs> need to get the other one next week. But, I, but, but I'm stubborn, so let me get you this one. All right, now this is just going to be real simple and easy. Last two words. All right. First two words, know Jesus. Second two words, serve Jesus. Third two words, love people. Love people. Yeah, yeah. What we do with people reflects our relationship with Jesus. Now, this, is, this might sting a little bit. All right. This is a true story. Let me just save it. Let me just save it. I'm going to save it because this one, this one right here, boy, this one right, this one might be a little stinger to it. All right, <laughs> bow, bow your head with me. All right, all right. <laughs> I'm letting Brian off the hook today. <laughs> all right, just bow your head with me. Yeah, right, amen. Hallelujah. God's grace, brother. <laughs> the grace of God and the mercy of God. All right, yeah, just bow your head with me. Yeah, this is just...